Hi everyone, welcome to Glow With Grace. I have wet hair again, and I have lots of questions to answer, so here we go. The first one is, why do I say that I would prefer an age gap of at least three years between children, if we ever have any more children? Um, I feel like there's a lot of reasons, and for me, one of the key ones is, I just don't feel like I could cope as well with two really young children spaced really close together in age. You know, I mean, twins to me or multiples would just be like, I don't know how, I don't know how people do that. <laughs> it's just not the kind of person I am <laughs> somehow to be able to cope with that. Um, one child is plenty for me at this point. Um, and I also feel like I notice a pattern that people who are more into like attachment parenting kind of style where, you know, you're co-sleeping and full-time breastfeeding and baby carrying and all those kind of things tend to prefer for there to be bigger gaps between children. That seems to be something that I notice as well. So I guess, you know, that applies for us as well. So that's part of it. And also um, a dear friend of mine, um, was actually looking into this for herself. She was curious, like, you know, what kind of, in a kind of traditional tribal indigenous kind of setting where the resources are limited, for example, like what did people um, do in terms of spacing children so that they didn't have like children popping out all over the place and um, kind of overrunning everything. So. What she found was that the typical pattern was spacing of four years. Now, of course, most of us are not in that kind of indigenous tribal setting at this point. And I also um, am interested that that's a pattern that we probably followed for quite a long time as a species. And to me, it just, it rings true. It, it seems to, from her research, have a lot to do with the body of the mother the regeneration of the body of the mother between births. The, it's a huge thing, of course, to create an entire other human out of your own body and to give birth to that and then to feed it full term, breastfeeding. Um, it's a massive tax on the mother's body and people who have children spaced closely together, women who have children close together, often have... Um, much more tooth problems, for example, than women who space them further apart. So um, in terms of, yeah, the mother's health, mother's regeneration, um, spacing further seems to be a great idea as well. Um, I feel like in terms of the, the child's relationship to the parent and also the children's relationship to each other, my feeling is also that um, I feel better about a wider gap between children um, and of course I totally understand that there are people out there who see everything that I'm saying the other way around it's always going to be like that right this is just the way that I see it um, I feel like it can be really hard on the oldest child when another child comes along especially if that first child um, is still in a kind of very dependent stage on their parent and they don't feel that they've really kind of completed their um, strong dependent phase with the parent and then suddenly another one comes along. Um, that can, you know, it's it's so typical, it's so common in our kind of societies that there's all this like jealousy and fighting and bickering and stuff between siblings. And my feeling is that by spacing children further apart, there's more chance that each child feels like they've really had good quality stack of mama time and dada time so that's my feeling i think that's the main points yeah there's more i'm sure but those are the main reasons why for me that's what it feels like and i don't know if i even ever want to have any more children um i've been reading stuff lately that well let's put it this way i wouldn't want to have a lot of children <laughs> um in terms of human population numbers. That's where I'm at with things right now. Um, yeah, let's see what happens. <sighs> what else? Someone asked, how do I manage to get a riot to sleep at around seven o'clock without 
me actually going to sleep with her at the same time because I usually go to sleep about an hour later. All right, what do we do? We have a whole kind of like winding down ritual from something like 5 p.m., something like between 5 and 6 p.m. We take a family bath together, all of us, and then we put on our white noise machine. We, we run a white noise machine next to her in bed um, all night long because it just kind of started when she was much younger. She would sleep much better if there was white noise in the background just like muffling out, you know, dogs barking and sudden noises and stuff like that. Um, okay, so we put on the white noise machine. I usually put um, a little bit of cream on her and, you know, a little bit of massage and um, get her night clothes on. And then we go to bed and I nurse her until she's asleep and I lay her down. And then I am just like... Gosh, I don't know, 50 feet away from her or something. Um, and I just do last bits of things of whatever I want to do um, online and, you know, brush my teeth and things like that. Um, and I'm, you know, right here, right next to her. So if she stirs at all, then I hear it. And she's at a point now where she doesn't tend to stir. Um, you know, once she's gone to sleep at 7 or 7.30 or whatever it is, she won't wake up for the next for five hours something like that typically so yeah that's just how it's evolved that I'm here she's asleep and an hour or less later I'm just right out there with her and then we go through the whole night and last night ah was just amazing I was so happy she's got another tooth at least one more tooth came in recently and sleeping was all over the place and last night for the first time she um, didn't wake up until dawn was already here. She's been waking up at like 4, 4.30, 5 in the morning. There's no light. Um, she's up and ready to go. And yeah, it's been really crazy. I'm noticing actually with the tooth stuff that she... Okay, it's like this. She sleeps during longer phases during teething, but she doesn't sleep as well. So she'll sleep across a span of like... I don't know, 11, 12 hours, um, and then also like two hour naps in the day, but the sleep isn't as good. So last night it was like the teething pain seemed to have gone. She only woke up twice the whole night and then she didn't wake up until dawn. It just, uh, just makes such a difference. And I'm gonna guess that she was probably gonna sleep less in the daytime today as well. So it's interesting, you know, just learning the child's patterns and working with those rhythms. Um, what are my views on birth control? Um, I'm not really into most of it, is probably the easiest way to say it. Um, the one thing that I found that ever really made sense to me was something that I feel like in North America it's called Persona. And in the UK, it's called Clear Blue. Is that the right way around or is it the other way around? I forget. But anyway, it's this thing that's like a little machine, little digital machine, and you it has like strips that you pee on, and then you put the strips into this little machine, and it reads it, and it gives you some kind of um, indication of your ovulation point, in the point you are at in your cycle. So... I believe this is marketed as like a fertility item. Like it's marketed as you can use this to work out the days that you're most fertile so that you can get pregnant. And of course you can use it for yourself for the opposite, right? You can use it, okay, these are the, it's only, there's only a window, right? Of like, what is it? Two, three, four days when people are like, when women are really fertile every month, which I think that's another thing that just trips me out. The amount of people who get pregnant, unwanted pregnancies when there's such a small window, only like, what, 12, 13 times a year for people to actually get pregnant, it's amazing. Um, so that's like, obviously non-intrusive. And, you know, if you're into like numbers and charts and all that kind of stuff, it's gonna give you that kind of scientific data. Um, I never actually used it myself because, um, you know, 
what we did was basically um, we would be really careful around my ovulation days and we would just trust that um, when everything was lined up and ready then a child would come but that's not going to work for everyone's belief system right <laughs> so the one thing that I've ever found that I feel good about are those little machines the persona and clear blue or something like that they're called um yeah everything else just feels strange intrusive unpleasant to me you know the pill and the coil and this and that um I'm not into them and of course there's you know charting and all these different things that you can do um yeah that's my perspective on it um how has my menstrual cycle changed since going raw and is it back now um yeah my menstrual cycle changed massively from going raw um it used to be extremely heavy quite painful um and completely irregular i mean all over the place before i was raw um then it became a lot more regular and lighter, easier to deal with, but still irregular compared to, you know, I know some women are just like absolutely on the clock every month, blah, blah, blah. I've never been like that. Um, and there would be points where I wouldn't actually really bleed, like almost at all, but I was ovulating. You know, obviously I have a child, like I can ovulate. Um, and my menstrual cycle is not back yet. Araya is 16 months old and I'm pretty happy about that. <laughs> I know some people get kind of freak out, you know, they want to have children closer together. Um, and of course everyone's cycle is different when it comes back. Um, you know, we have friends, I think one of our friends, she got it back at six weeks postpartum. And then, you know, there's like seven months, 10 months, two years, all kinds of everything in between. Um, yeah, so as far as I know, I'm not ovulating again yet. And she's 16 months. So let's see where it goes. Um, someone asked about toddlers and technology, like iPads, iPods, computers. Do we intend to... Mm, kind of introduce those things much to Araya or like have help her to use them those kind of things that doesn't really feel like a direction we'd want to go in and I'm sure she's going to be interested in stuff you know so I imagine the direction we'll try to choose is um showing her things kind of basic things if that's what she really really wants but not putting any kind of emphasis on it. You know, she vastly prefers to be outside and be picking flowers and berries and throwing stones around and stuff like that. So we'll see if she really has any interest even in that kind of thing. Um, but, you know, she sees us using things and she likes to pick up like an iPod or something and go, wow pretend it's a phone which I don't even know like how she picked up on that because we almost never use phones um <laughs> but somehow she knows um yeah we'll see not really a priority for us and you know there's useful things about computers and stuff obviously like google's amazing I remember the encyclopedias that we used to have in my house when I was growing up they were like encyclopedias from from my granddad, you know, like from the 1920s or something. And that's what I used to use <laughs> to do like all my schoolwork. You know, there would be a question about, I don't know, how do you can pilchards or something? And I'd be looking it up in this encyclopedia. It's crazy to me now that that was like, that was my source of knowledge, this set of books that sat on the bookshelf. Um, and now of course, you know, we are blessed with the internet and we can research anything we want. Um, this is getting kind of long. Let me see if I can do maybe one more question. What have we got? Um, okay. Why don't we eat raw chocolate? Here we go. Raw cacao. Um, 
it's pretty much to do with the body reaction that we get. So my husband and I have both been eating raw food, completely raw, for, um, well, for him for like 15 years. And I've been eating this way for like almost 11 years and completely raw for like the last nine years, something like that. So our systems, our bodies are really kind of clean, you know, we've done a lot of cleanses, we've done a lot of colon hydrotherapy, we live in a really clean environment. Okay, so cacao has stimulating properties to it. You know, it has caffeine, it has theobromine. For us, when we eat it, it's really, really fun, right? It's just amazing. It totally blows open our heart chakras and our third eye chakras. We're just like buzzing and feeling connected and wanting to connect with people and just loving everything and ideas flowing and creative and brrr, it's amazing. And then there's the come down. <laughs> and that's what we don't want to deal with. Um, for both of us, if we eat cacao and then we stop, we're basically miserable for like the next three days, just absolute wrecks, angry, irritable, just grouchy and fatigued and everything that happens when you come off a stimulant. And for us, it's not worth it anymore. I ate massive amounts of raw chocolate in my earlier years. I literally lived in two raw chocolate factories <laughs> in the UK. That's where I lived, you know, producing raw chocolate, eating it day in, day out, just buzzed out of my brain all the time. Um, and I don't choose that anymore, especially with a child and breastfeeding that child. I don't want to be on that kind of roller coaster. So, I mean, neither of us have eaten chocolate for, I would guess it's years now, probably three, four, five years. I don't know how long. Um, and it's, yeah, it's, we just don't find any value in it for ourselves. Um, I understand that other people really love it and feel a lot of benefits from it and don't feel such of a hit from it and all of those kind of things. Everyone's different. For us, that's the situation we, well, Mr. Monarch doesn't care about things like um, desserts and stuff or anyway, but for myself and for Araya, we love carob. Love carob. We sell amazing raw carob and that's what we have here and that's what we use often actually in combination with the chocolate flavor extract that we sell from medicine flour. You put those two together and it's like you're eating chocolate. Like why would you want to eat actual chocolate that like completely messes your system up and you feel terrible afterwards when you could eat, you know, carob or carob chocolate flavor extract or peely nuts. Peely nut chocolate is incredible. You know, we, we have videos on that anyway, but basically peely nuts when you kind of grind them down especially in a stone grinder and make them into like a nut butter is completely like chocolate it looks like chocolate it tastes like chocolate incredible consistency and it's not chocolate you know there's no caffeine in it there's no stimulation so that's yeah that's the picture from our point of view we don't want to be like messing our adrenals up on that kind of stuff we appreciate the fun aspect of it, but you know, the come down is just not something that we're interested in. Hope that makes sense. Um, I guess I'll wrap it up there because it's getting pretty long and it sounds like Araya wants some mama. So thank you for your questions and let me know if you have more and I'll see you next time. Ciao.